Okay, guys. Okay, guys, we are all ready. Please welcome the great Ross Marquand to the stage for Sister Kirkendall. the originals and then you've gotten to touch the new yeah. and then you're also a like, pivotal in the whole civil war story arc which as a fan of the comic book was beyond rad to see you brought into live action because yeah. that was that's the one thing about walking dead that as a fan you always question is those books came out so long ago and it started for me with the governor mm -hmm. like who are they going to get to to do this because the way that Kirkman wrote him was so freaking bastardly. Yeah, <laughs> bastardly. <laughs> and, like, and so then there's the performance and it's perfect and then now we're moving on to Negan and right, right there is another great example of Jeffrey Dean Morgan of like the perfect Negan but the biggest question I think everybody had when show started was who are they going to have be Rick Grimes right. and you getting to work with Andrew Lincoln uh, and getting to see Carl and all those guys before they had left yeah. is such a dope thing because now you know Aaron going through like I said the Civil War and everything you're up in the mix but to be able to at least be there for his farewell had to have been pretty dope oh man I mean I, I think uh, we, we, we never really uh, recovered the vibe. I mean, it was it's, it's still a great show to work on, don't get me wrong, but the, the leadership and the uh, kindness that, that Andy exuded every day on set. I mean, Andrew would show up on days that he was not needed. He, would, he was, wouldn't be in a scene. He would show up and just be supportive. He would be the first person to show up and the last person to leave. Um, Genuine. I mean, that, that's not an exaggeration. Like it was kind of awe-inspiring how how giving he was as yeah. an actor, and also just happens to be the best father and good, best person. I mean, he just, he was just incredible. And uh, you know, when he left, um, there was not a there wasn't a dry eye on that set. You know, I mean, everyone was just realizing how great of a guy he was, and to lose him not only as Rick but also as the leader that he was as a person. It was uh, it was sad. It was really yeah. sad. So I mean, we, we we obviously know. I'm sure you guys are aware that he's not dead. Dead. Uh, <laughs> he got flown away in the helicopter. And, you know, he's around somewhere. You know, I'm sure, I'm sure we'll get revealed at some point. But uh, whether that's in the movies or they're talking about maybe having a spinoff for him, um, we'll see him again. I'm sure. Yeah. What was that? You know, did you audition or did you get a phone call? What was that whole process of like, hey, like this role, you know, The Walking Dead at that point of you coming on is like this huge phenomenon yeah. that was really kind of just shattering, you know, everything for both TV series at the time, but especially for horror TV. Yeah. Uh, like there wasn't, to my remembrance, when Walking Dead started, anything close to like that, <coughs> like the horror fan on cable TV. And so now it has this reputation by the time you come along. What was that like getting 
that process. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned because um, Frank Darabont and uh, Gail Ann Hurd, of course, Gail worked on all the, she used to be married to James Cameron and she wrote the Terminator movies. Uh, she, I think, co wrote The Abyss. I mean, the incredible mind. Um, and she and Frank literally pitched uh, Walking Dead to HBO two or three years before AMC picked it up. And at that time, HBO said, uh, we're not really a genre type network. We, we don't, we stay away from that. And of course, the next year they came out with True Blood. Yeah. And, uh, and then two years after that, they came out with Game of Thrones, which were both massive hits, of course, but it was just kind of a slap in the face to, to Gail and Frank. They're like, why, what do you, what do you mean you don't do genre shows? Yeah. Um, and then uh, they went to AMC, I think, they, a few networks had passed on, on Walking Dead, they just said it's simply not. Oh, NBC was one of them too. Damn. So it was gonna be on network for a time. That would that would have been a bad choice, I think, because we couldn't do half the shit that we did, yeah. uh, <laughs> gore-wise and everything else. Um, so, uh, you know, once it got picked up on AMC, we were you know all thrilled, of course, I mean, to, to see this uh, amazing, you know, source material come to life. And I was a fan before I got on it, so, I auditioned twice before I auditioned this last time. And uh, I had given up acting a month prior. I was totally done. I had been out there in LA for 10 years, and I had no job, no career. I had $100,000, $115,000 of debt. Uh, and it was credit card debt, so it was just accruing more and more each month. So the, I think my, my, my worst credit card, I think I had like a 21% uh, interest rate. So can you imagine just like every month your yeah. debt just keeps accruing more and more. You're like, I will never get out of this, you know? Yeah. And it, it felt like I was suffocating. I just said, I, I, I realized that this, this dream I had since I was a kid was probably not gonna come true. Yeah. And I said, okay, screw it. I'm, I'm gonna give up and I'm gonna move to New York. I'm gonna get, uh, become a skilled uh, photographer, do wedding photography, do whatever I need to to pay the bills, sure. still do like writing and art just to scratch that creative side of me, um, but I gave up acting entirely, and then a month later, my, my uh, manager called me and said, we got your audition, I was like, oh, I thought you guys literally forgot about me, like, I thought it was, <laughs> they thought they had dropped me as a client, um, and then uh, I said, okay, well, I, I'm actually not doing acting anymore, and she's like, well, we worked really hard to get you this audition, can you please go, and I said, okay, and um, it was the funniest thing, because it's the only time in my life where I didn't care if I got the role or not. I, I was excited to like go in there again, but I thought, you know, it's not gonna happen. I know how this goes. I'm, I'm gonna get rejected again. And the first thing I thought of after the audition was, I wonder what I should have for dinner tonight. <laughs> like it wasn't normally like, oh God, I should have done this different, I should have done this, oh, well, I, I, that was wrong, I, I made a bad decision, I wonder why don't I do the line this way. The only time in my life where I did not audition, I was like, man, screw it. Eh, what's, for, what's for dinner? You know, and it's. I think it's a good lesson for me. Is that you know the the lesson isn't never give up because I definitely gave up. Uh, the lesson is you don't know what the universe has in store for you. Um, you just have to give away whatever expectation you have of like I'll only be happy if I have this person in my life, or I'll only be happy if I have this job or this car or this whatever. You don't have any idea what the universe has in store for you. You just have to let go and hope that it works out the best it will. I think that's the lesson I learned from it, anyway, for sure. So, Aaron goes through quite a transitional phase in Walking Dead. Yeah. We see him develop uh, both, I would say, inter internally, spiritually, and uh, <laughs> you know, all the inside stuff, but uh, outwardly as well. Sure. When you get your arm uh, taken off yeah. and then replaced with the uh, Freaking badass, like I've, I've called it ro robotic, but it's more just like a weapon melee type system. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's definitely like a He Man, but <laughs> man, man, man at arms, you know? Yeah. yeah, like, so what has been in some of like the funnest days on set as Aaron for you? I mean, the last couple years have been cool because I've been pushing for a darker version of Aaron for the last several years, and luckily, uh, Angela King, you know, our showrunner. Was, was really open to the ideas that I had, and I just said, you know, this guy has lost so many people that he cares about. Yeah. At a certain point, um, he's got a snap. You know, he's been beaten up by Rick, he's been beaten up by the Oceansiders, he's been beaten up by the, the, the Heapsters, the Saviors, like every group 
has just beaten this guy down. Yeah. At a certain point, he's gonna stop being nice guy and he's going to turn dark. And uh, she was said, okay, great. And, and how do you feel about, we're, we're gonna cut your arm off, are you cool with that? I'm like, oh yeah, great. <laughs> I was like, that's terrific, I, I love this idea, you know? Because um, I felt like it was a good physical manifestation of all the loss that he'd suffered. You know? sure. um, so I was thrilled that in the last couple of seasons, he's gotten to use the mace arm and, and everything else to be just kind of a killing machine, you know? And he's still a good guy, he's still diplomatic and a good leader, but he only gives people one chance, whereas before I think he gave people several yeah, chances. chances. Yeah. yeah, and now, like with, uh, I hope you guys are mostly caught up, but like in the last few episodes, there was a guy who almost shot him, and then he just got either jammed or ran out of bullets, and uh, you know, that, that, he literally could have killed him if that you know gun was loaded, and then uh, in the next episode, he just was like, you know, he's trying to plead his case, like, don't kill me, don't kill me, and he's just like, boom, boom, boom. It's, yeah. It was so satisfying to have that moment because uh, it's just a side of it we've never seen before, you know? It, it's almost interesting to watch your character development and then Jeffrey Dean Morgan's character mm. development because in the comic book, Negan is not like the lovable anti-hero that he is on the show. And so with you starting out, and like you said, like man of a hundred chances type of a persona, to watch you kind of go the opposite direction has been some really good stuff. Thank you, yeah. Um, I would be remiss if we don't step away from the straight up horror for a minute though and talk about some uh, dark stuff <laughs> in the comic Marvel world yeah. that you uh, getting to do uh, Red Skull in uh, Infinity War and Endgame. When we were there for the opening night, the first shot of you oh, yeah. when uh, Widow and Hawkeye go to find that Soul Stone, and it's you that's kind of that gatekeeper. The theater lost their mind. Yeah. Like, so what was that like to get that role and be told, like, hey man, like, you're actually picking up the torch of this character, yeah. and not only that, but your scene actually leads to the Black Widow's death, which all these people love. So it's like a double whammy. And Gamora, yeah. Yeah, and Gamora. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it was nutty because, uh, I didn't know what I booked. They didn't tell you. So it was all very secretive even back then. So when I got the part, uh, it was a Hugo Weaving voice match for a German character that he played, but they couldn't even confirm that it was Red Skull. And I was like, all right, what, what is this? And it was still an untitled Disney project, which later got talked, I think it was called Mary Lou. So we were not told anything. And then I get to the set, and you know it's a huge facility, like 150 people waiting there, and they put me in this motion capture uh, outfit, and they start putting the dots on my face, and we're doing all these camera tests, and I'm like, what the hell is this, you know? Yeah. And finally, I meet the Russo brothers, and I'm like, oh, that's Anthony and Joe Russo. Oh, this is like a this is a bigger than just like some <laughs> random yeah, yeah. little project. I'm like, and I and I asked them, I was like, what what is this? Because <laughs> I asked the makeup artist, like, they didn't tell you. I'm like, no. I'm like, what is this? What is this project? And they're like, it's a, it's the new Avengers movies. And I'm like, oh, well that's <laughs> that's a different thing altogether than I was expecting, and I probably should have known that. Uh, but I, luckily on the on the flight over, I memorized all the lines because I didn't know I even had to be off book. I thought it was just going to be a voiceover thing that I was going to read from. A computer monitor, sure. um, but luckily I studied on the way over, and um, it was a blast. I mean, it was just such a cool way to work, because, you know, me and Josh Brolin and Mark Ruffalo, all the guys who had the crazy CGI, you're wearing the motion capture outfit, and then you have, like, a, a head camera that's like a, a halo attached to your head, and yeah. the camera just sits like this, and everywhere you go, it goes with you, so there's no way you can shake it. It's, it's, it's recording all of your data all the time, and then they can change your skin tone, take off your nose, whatever. Um, and it was just such a cool way to act because you're not worried about, oh, where's the camera? What is, it, is it over there? Because you are the camera. You're giving all the information you need in the suit and if the, the camera's on your head. So they, they capture everything they need and then they can just plug and play that into a computer and replace your face, add a cloak to you, whatever. It was just awesome. It was a great way to work. That's wild. Yeah. Like, going to film school and like study the, the evolution of all that stuff like Mandalorian using the uh, the vault or whatever they're calling that stage with the LED screen oh, yeah, and all yeah, that. Yeah. like that kind of stuff yeah. uh, 
that's wild to think that it's all just you with the stuff on you and oh, they're yeah. just taking that data. Out. And you think about like the first Star Wars, you know, they shot that in, um, oh God, the, the Tatooine stuff was shot in, like where was it again? Tunisia. Tunisia, thank you. And that, and apparently was hot as hell. People were passing out left and right. right. And all the stuff in the Mandalorian was shot on the soundstage in Burbank. Yeah. You know, it's like nice air conditioning and people were like wearing jackets because they're too cold. It's like, but you yeah. have this desert setting on Tatooine. It's yeah. just a funny way to work, you know. It's 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 a lot more comfortable than I think the, the, than we ever had in the past, you know. You know, you mentioned matching Hugo Weaving. That's not the only Marvel voice you have matched. Yeah. Um, speaking for, my wife who loves the blacklist that's like that's like the uh the motivation to, for us to go to the gym is to watch the blacklist episodes oh nice and because it's only at the gym that they are or what are no on um, netflix but oh gotcha okay, like, okay. Nice. The, the rule is like we can only watch blacklist if hey, if you go to the gym oh, that's cool i like that that's, yeah. good. that's your little treat at the end I yes, okay. yes. <laughs> and so you know spader being such a good bad guy there yeah Ultron. He's a good bad guy in everything. Well, yeah, but the, 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 the voice <laughs> actor he put in for Ultron, yeah. um, when What If came out, I had no idea. I think Disney even kind of sold it that they were going to be like these individual stories. Mm -hmm. And so after like that Marvel zombie episode, all of a sudden it starts to kind of like drop these clues that no, they're telling something bigger. It's all coming together. Yeah, yeah. and. The fact that you get to play not just Ultron but Ultimate Ultron, which really that character kicked their ass for a while. He was the best. Yeah. He, like just for those who haven't seen it, I hope it's not. A, it's yeah, like, sorry. He like splits Thanos in half with a thought. It's just like it's yeah, just, it's awesome. I mean, it's such a he's such a good killing machine because it's just logic. It's just pure. There's no emotionality. Yeah. It's just, oh, here's the problem. The problem is chaos. The problem is life. Let me solve this by destroying and eradicating all life in the universe. And it's just it's just a complete killing machine. It's amazing, you know? So. What was that? Uh, was that a little bit more forthcoming, I guess, than the, the Red Skull? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They definitely were like, this is what this project is. And, and I, I voiced uh, uh, Ultron before on a, on a VR video game called Avengers Damage Control. And also for this upcoming um, cruise thing, that it, it sounds really amazing. Like uh, Disney's doing this Avengers cruise, which sounds awesome, and I really want to do it. It's coming up in, like the next two weeks, I think. But um, it's me, Evangeline Lilly, uh, Paul Rudd, Brie Larson. You're gonna be part of the restaurant. Thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so like you go into the cruise ship, and everything seems hunky dory. It's all good, and then like there's pim pim particles, and like you you and your family have to like you know, basically you put these things together and then all of a sudden the ship starts going haywire and you hear Ultron come over, he's like, what What are you doing here? Why are you people in my boat? You know, all this stuff. <laughs> and then all of a sudden it just goes haywire and you have to work with your family to fix the, the issue. So. I'm going on that cruise in December. So oh, are you really? Yeah, so I would get oh, to. you already bought the tickets? Is it available? Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, snap. Yeah. Okay, I didn't know. <laughs> I was like, I, was like I, I told him, I was like, I want to be on the maiden voyage. I don't care if it's like the Titanic. I, if, if that's how I go, I, I don't care. I'm like, I need to be on the ship. So, damn, okay. Yeah. I got to get on that boat. <laughs> okay. That makes me even more excited to know exactly what that restaurant's going to have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of wacky things that happen on the boat, so yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, so yeah, the, so they hired me for that, and they, they were like, we're also going to, we'd love for you to come back as Red Skull and Ultron for season one of What If, yeah. So. That, that is very, very cool. Yeah, yeah, I mean, the fact that Ultron 2 was like Ultron melded with the Infinity Gauntlet, the artwork of that character is yeah. very, very cool. Yeah, it was cool. Um, so, we had like one of the biggest conventions ever, Star Wars Celebration, a couple years or a couple weeks back, and I'm sitting there and I'm watching. So bummed I missed it. Yeah, but I'm sitting there and I'm watching this panel live air, Lego Star Wars, and uh, they're like, for like five seconds, they didn't leave it up very long, but they're like, oh by the way, Lego Star Wars Summer Vacation is coming out, and guess what? Here's the cast. And I'm like, holy shit, that looks like rocks, and I back, 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 pause. Oh, yeah. And right there, it's 
Ross is going to do Han Solo for the next uh, Lego Star Wars, and that is very cool. I'm excited too because I remember recording that like a year and a half ago, and I don't remember what I said, or I, mean, I remember it was like a bunch of lines, but uh, it was before we started shooting season 11 of The Walking Dead, so I don't recall everything I said, but I remember being really funny and, and, and having a lot of fun stuff in there, so I'm excited to see, because Lego Star Wars is like, well, Lego anything for that matter. I, I just love what they do with it. It's kind of like when Family Guy does Star Wars. And For sure. Yeah. It's just brilliant. They're great. Like ba the Batman Lego movie is like one of my favorite movies of all time. So. Yeah, it's pretty fantastic. Like Batman. Well, we'll learn it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. The, uh, the thing about getting to do Harrison Ford, too, like trying to do Han Solo, like, it seems like Harrison, like, even when he was at Celebration for William's 90th birthday, it was kind of like he still wasn't entirely happy to be there. It's like, happy <laughs> birthday, John. Yeah, because I, I mostly, when I grew up doing angry Harrison Ford from like the Fugitive era on. Yeah. That's what I, because I was like 12 when I saw the Fugitive. I was like, that movie really affected me. But I remember seeing Harrison in that in, in interrogation room in Chicago, and he's getting, you know, pressured by these cops, and he's like, I didn't kill my wife. I fought with a war arm man. You know, and it's just like that crazy, like that that that. I'm sorry if I scared you. But it's just like he gets so into it, and and then when when I booked the Star Wars things for the VR and everything else, they were like, you're you're doing too gruff, Harrison. It's it's older Harrison you're doing. They need like 1970s, like, hey princess, I'm sorry. The Millennium Falcon will get you there. Don't worry about it. You know, like that smug, kind of charming, but like youthful Harrison yeah. that wasn't in my wheelhouse. And I really had to like find a way to reverse engineer my voice and reverse puberty my voice a little bit because I was a former smoker and I just have that sort of, you know, Raspy. gravel already. Yeah. So I had to find a way to make it a little bit not higher pitch, but you know what I mean. It's just yeah, yeah. a little, little softer, a little younger. Yeah. yeah. So. That's a I know we all look forward to getting to check out that special because, it's, it's like you said, the, the stuff that they put out is pretty, pretty great. Yeah, yeah, they're great. Um, checking time oh, yeah. here. Uh, the thing too about getting to act both live action and that voice is pretty cool that you're diversifying. When you are doing voice acting, there's always like those behind the scene clips from like Pixar movies and stuff. And you know, here's Tom Hanks, and he's like over the top animated in the booth. Well, sign. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's Castaway. That's not even. <laughs> boss, boss. <laughs> like how, I guess how like over the top, like dramatic are you when you are voice acting? Are you like very emotive and oh, you're yeah. moving around? Yeah. You have to be because you know, if you're on camera, you have the luxury of, of having your facial expression and your body and everything to, to, to tell the story. But if you're doing voiceover, all you have is your voice. And if you're not bringing a physicality and a movement, and frankly, like a, um, uh, there's a certain, there's a certain like technique to, to holding your, your voice a certain way that will produce a different sound versus if I'm doing Harrison, I'm just like, hey kiddo, how you doing? What's going on, you know? Versus, hey kiddo, how you doing? You all right? Like, it just sounds different. Yeah, you hear the difference. Right you know? Right so you just have to really get your whole body into it. And I think that, that helps a lot, yeah. When you are on set of, like, The Walking Dead, are you throwing voices around? I, I used to a lot more, uh, you know, and then, because, like, some, someone early on in season five when I first got on the show, I think it was Lana Masterson, she knew that I did impressions from some YouTube videos she saw. And then it was like, everyone was just like, do this, do this, do this. And then I got kind of burnt out. I was like, all right, I gotta stop doing this all the time. You know, like, it's, it's, it's like, I'm, I, it's like, I need to learn my lines, you guys. I, I can't, I can't, you know. Um, but uh, after a while, people were asking me to do them. And of course, after a while, I, one of the producers was kind of egging me on, or Melissa actually, McBride was, was saying, do your, do your Daryl impression, you know? And I was like, mm, no, 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 you don't, you don't do impressions of people that you work with. It's a, always a bad idea. And then I, and then they asked me to do it, and uh, it went over a little weird. Not gonna lie. So yeah, you, get, you always got to be careful about who you do it for. Andy, Andy was always really uh, sweet about it. He always like wanted me to do it because, of course, like Rick is nowhere near his actual voice. Yeah, he's a very uh, not posh Brit, but he's a, you know, he's got a nice kind of regal sound to him. 
Uh, so, you know, Rick Grimes doesn't sound like that. You know, he's all over here. Yeah, all right, we got to go around here. You know, he doesn't yeah, ever something like that. He's actually like, oh, yeah, it's lovely. No, so um, I'm very, very happy to be here. Yeah, so, um, you know, it's great. It's great. I love Jordan. It's lovely here. It and it's just me. nothing like it. It, it tripped me out the first time I like heard him in a panel or something, and he came out and like. Oh yeah, he's yeah. always cross legged He's like, yeah, so no, I was over here. It was lovely. I was in the bath. It was great. You know, so yeah, it was, it's, it's very it's, interesting. Yeah. It's funny to imagine you guys having the conversation on between shots, and there's Andrew, and then. He goes back to when he first met you as Rick, and he wants to beat the shit out of you. Right. Well, that, that's I, I said to someone yesterday, um, like one of my favorite moments of memories from that show was my second episode. Um, the only time Andy ever broke character, because when he's in that mode, he takes his shit super seriously, and, and he does not break character ever. Uh, except for one time, in the, in the six years that I worked with him, the only time he broke character was in my second episode when he, I'm, you know, I'm telling him everybody about Alexandria. He got these big walls, and it's a really safe place to live. And um, then he's, he's flipping through the photos, and of course he walks up and just punches me in the face. And each time he came within this, you know, this close of my my nose, and it was very, very, it was all very well coordinated. I fell each time, no worries. But on the last time we did it, it was at like 27 different takes. He came up and he connected with my nose big time, and you know the thing when you get when you punch in the nose, your eyes just water up immediately. But I was supposed to be knocked out, so I'm like wincing like this and like keeping it together. Like oh, I'm supposed to be knocked out, but I'm lit, like your eyes are tearing up. And uh, as soon as he yelled cut or the director yelled cut, he goes, "Oh my god, I'm so sorry, mate. You're all right. I, I didn't mean to do that. I'm really sorry." And I was like, "Oh no, it's like Rick Ryan just punched me. It's all good. You know, like, it's kind of a cool moment, you know." So. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Yeah, I gotta ask you, what is? I mean, we just talked about Melissa trying to get you to do his impression, but what is it like working with Norman Reedus? Because Norman Reedus has kind of become the new Rick. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, I, th I think the show is always going to be at the end of the day about you know Rick and his journey. But of course, since he left the show <coughs> years ago, um, it, it has opened the door for for Daryl and for even Negan uh, to have this redemption arc and to kind of step up as the de facto leaders because, you know, Rick is gone. Um, and it's cool. I like I like the fact that people have still continue to watch the show even after Rick, who's arguably people's favorite character, still watch the show and they still tune in because, you know, they built an amazing franchise and it's, it's an incredible show and I'm just happy that we get to kind of land finally in this next eight episodes in, in October. I know, too, I think the thing that keeps people hanging on is the fact, if, if Rick was the only character that you liked, the fact that uh, uh, we are promised at some point those movies. Um, yeah. You know, we were promised them kind of, a, they were coming very soon, and then, of course, COVID happened. Which COVID put kind of messed it up. Yeah. Right. And so, but the fact that, like you said, you know that there is, whether or not they end up being like prequels or some spin-off story or whatever like you know that there's more Rick coming eventually yeah and so while we if you're waiting for Rick while you wait for Rick you might as well just watch the rest of them yeah and see what they're up to there's a Daryl spin-off that's been announced so you know there's gonna be more stories that he has to tell yep but Maggie and Negan as well yeah, yeah Maggie and Negan but at the end of the day it, the Walking Dead is the Walking Dead like that's the catalyst that's the core type of the thing so and now that you are one of the, the focal points of it that i mean congratulations man. that's you thank you um let's take some q a to make sure we all get those people who want to ask ross a question about a question does anybody have a question that they want to ask yeah go ahead when you do your voices you're you're you want to hire you for a voice do you have like an existing list of voices that you can do, or they pick a random that you've never done before. Is it sure I can I can do that as well? Yeah, it's uh, it kind of depends. Like so, Family Guy do a lot of their voice matching stuff, uh, and sometimes I'll do Scratch when Seth MacFarlane or Patrick Warburton or some of the other guys aren't available. So I do like Quagmire sometimes, or Brian or Joe, and like hey bear, that's definitely. And one time I was actually leaving the, the, the recording when Patrick Warburton was coming in and the, the casting director was like, oh, Patrick, you gotta meet Ross. He sometimes does your scratch tracks. And he goes, 
Oh, really? Good, let's hear it. Like, well, I don't know. It's kind of weird to do it in front of you. I mean, you're the guy. I don't think it's kind of. It's kind of awkward. And he looked at me for a second. He kind of squints his eyes like he does, and he goes, "I don't sound anything like that." <laughs> Touche, Patrick Wilbur. Um, no, but like, he's awesome. Yeah, I get a chance to meet him. He's freaking salt of the earth, good dude. But um, basically, like, I have a list of like 60 or so people that I do, and I have uh, Family Guy and all these other people just like to have that on file. So. If they want to use me for one of those voices, great. If they want to, in this case, for like Hugo Weaving, I'd never try to do Hugo Weaving except for maybe like Agent Smith, I suppose, because I remember everyone in high school when that came out was like, Mr. Anderson, you know? It was like that was the thing that everyone was kind of doing back then, but I never thought to do him outside of that movie because Hugo does, I mean, he's awesome. he's an Aussie by, by you know, his natural born, but but like he does British, German, you know, he's, he's all over the place. Um, so oftentimes they'll just call my agent and say, does Ross do this person, can he try? And then you just give it a whirl. And that's just kind of like the best thing. But the one that came to me the fastest was John C. Riley, because it oh, kind of right. was out of necessity. It was for Wreck-It Ralph, um, which at that point, like no one knew what it was, but it was clear that like that was gonna be the new big uh, Pixar movie. and. Um, I had just finished an audition at, at Nickelodeon, and they're like, hey, aren't you in Burbank? Can you go over to Disney and do this audition? I was like, okay, sure, yeah, what's the, it's a, it's a voice match with John C. Riley. I was like, oh, I've never done John C. Riley. And they're like, well, just, you gotta do it, because we, we really need it, and I was like, okay. And I was in the car, and I was thinking about Step Brothers. I was like, I don't know what, oh, wait a minute, that's, did we just become best friends? Yep, <laughs> like, and it just kind of clicked, and I never, thought to do him, but it just kind of happened. And sometimes the voices will come like that, but most of the time I have to be like in, in my room listening over and over again to get it down. And it takes a lot of time, but, but sometimes it just happens. So, yeah. Do you, as you listen, are you recording yourself to listen to yourself? Yeah, so I'll, I'll basically uh, listen to the reference track, have that going, and then I'll have a, a, another track, which is my track, and I'll record it, pl press play, listen to theirs, do my version and just go back and forth. So I'll just, you know, literally just line them up. And as soon as I can get like to a place where they're looking at about the same frequency and, and uh, the, the right the right uh, tempo and pacing, then I'm like, cool. Right. Then, yeah, I, yeah. then I'll send in the audition. Yeah. It's like you're coaching yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I spend, I spend a lot of time alone in a booth. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I live in a cabin in the woods too, so I'm like, I really don't see anybody outside of work. It's, really, it's great. You know? I talk to myself all the time. <laughs> Anybody else for the question? Like, okay. uh, uh, any, uh, any future plans for Red Skull uh, or any other character in the Marvel universe? Uh, <laughs> I like how there's like 10 cameras rolling. <laughs> I, I can't say shit. Yeah, I, I, mean, I wish I could. I could. <laughs> You know, nowadays you, you sign so many non disclosure agreements you can't say anything. So I'm like, I wish I could say yes, but yeah. let's just say maybe. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, since you're doing all these new um, voice acting, would you open up to any like, anime or any other kind of time? Yeah, so I mean, that's kind of, now that we're done with the show, like I really want to do a lot more of that. Um, I don't know if you guys watched Invincible on Amazon. Yes. It's it's the same guy who did Walking Dead, Robert Kirkman, and he hired basically half the Walking Dead cast. Uh, and Stephen Young, Blake Glenn, he's the, the lead in it. And uh, me, Michael Cudlitz, uh, what's that? So, yeah, the character named Abraham, Maggie, Sasha, uh, Tyrese. I mean, they've got everybody from, from Walking Dead in that show. And I love doing animation. I mean, it's just such a fun way to work because we just finished season two of Invincible last week, too. and like you really do get to bring that physicality so much more when you're doing the fighting and, you know, there's, there's a lot of fighting and gore. If you guys haven't seen it, it's amazing. But um, yeah, I mean, I think that that's what I'd love to be doing for the next few years until I find my next on-camera gig. Because I, I really do kind of want to wait. I want to find the right project that's, that's kind of in league with like Walking Dead or something of that caliber. Because I don't just want to do like some, you know, random show that just pays the bills. I want to do a show that really excites me. And until then, I love doing animation. Oh, yeah. uh, speaking of animation, what about your upcoming show next year, Avenging Justice? Avenging Justice? Mm -hmm. um, looks like it's coming out next year. Avenging Justice. 
Uh, they sell, what was it called? I think it's called Adventure Justice. Oh. Is it on IMDb or something? Yeah. Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't know what that is. <laughs> maybe I'm, maybe they, maybe they had a working title when I recorded it. You, sometimes you get, you have like, like with Avengers, it was Mary Lou, and that's obviously not what they called it. Um, so maybe it was a project I did, and then it got, they name changed, I don't know. I'm sorry, yeah. Um, the question, um, this is another question. What was your Conan portrait of him? Oh, so back in season five and six, um, there was a lot of spoilers. There was a, there was a group called the Spoiling Dead, and um, their, their sole purpose was to, to like get scripts from crew members and release them before the actual episodes aired, which is kind of wild that we had people like, you know, it was, it was a really kind of fun era because like there were so many people waiting outside of set trying to get pictures and trying to piece things together. But it was actually a really amazing time to be a part of something that like that many people were genuinely caring about every single week of what was gonna happen. But because of that, we were given uh, the opportunity, we, we all had to give code names for our characters and we were allowed to come up with our own code names and Never Ending Story is like one of my favorite movies of all time. And so I was like, I want to be a trade. And uh, most most of the crew guys were like, I'll try you. And I've been like, I was like, Never Ending Story, you gotta watch it. And they're like, okay. And that became like, we, we had a certain point, like we didn't even refer to each other by our first names. Like Alana, Alana was Batman. I think Norman was Godzilla. Uh, so it was a kind of a fun thing. We'd be like, what's up, Godzilla? What's up? You know, it was like, that's how we all refer to each other. It was kind of cool. So, yeah. Yeah. I kind of felt like we were in Top Gun. I was like, what's up, Maverick? <laughs> so, by the way, has anyone seen the new Top, Top Gun? Yeah. I heard it's amazing, right? It's so good. Very good. Everyone keeps raving about it. I gotta check it out. Okay. Nice. I've seen the first Top Gun. Me too. That's a good one, yeah. Anybody else have a question for us? Uh, when you were in the motion capture suit, uh, or anyone else really, um, did any of y'all get to like goof around and bust a move and see like Red Skull do some funny things on the screen? <laughs> That's wow. I, I think I was so intimidated being in the presence of like the Russo brothers that I didn't uh, think to do that because it was like a very serious like last minute job. We were we were I was brought in towards the end of production. It was like one of the last two or three days of shooting, um, so I was like. I gotta be, I gotta be Johnny on the spot. I really wanted to, to do a good job, and um, I didn't do it on that one. But I did a Star Wars video game years ago where I had to do the motion capture suit, and we were oftentimes doing the floss. And, and like, I played this like three eyed, three eyed alien named Roscoe, um, and uh, just see, because you, oh, the, the cool thing is like they have really rudimentary three D renderings of you in real time on TVs all over the wall. So if there's four TVs all all around you, so you get to see what you look like. So seeing this little character doing the floss, I was like, this is ridiculous, and I'm loving every moment of it, you know, so. It's cool, yeah. We get to do some fun stuff on the show, yeah. So, yeah. Sure. So you talked a little bit about uh, wanting to keep scratching that creative itch when you weren't acting as much, and now that a lot of your work is copying other, other voices, how do you keep your own creativity within that process? Ooh. Um, oh, that's interesting. So, like, how do how do I like find my you own yourself with the other person, like melding two? Yeah, I mean, the, the, obviously, with voice matching, there's not as much creativity because I'm I'm trying to sound as as uh, keep the fidelity of their voice as best I can. Uh, like, but with Ultron, for example, that was a fun process because um, when I got the part, I thought I was just going to do a straight James Spader impression, which is what I did for Avengers: Damage Control, that VR game. But for what if, um, the director said, this is actually a combo of Vision and, and Ultron and Iron Man, so it's, it's kind of a different sound we want. And initially I was gonna do like a half British Ultron, because Vision's a part of it, and, and then it just sounded like I was a bad, it sounded like an American trying to do a bad British accent, so they scrapped that. But then the director had a really great idea of infusing him with um, Carl Sagan, the physicist. So I don't know if you guys know Carl Sagan. He's a the, the, yeah. So um, basically, they wanted a James Spader meets Carl Sagan, and we came up with the voice on the fly, which was such a cool experience to like have a little bit of that guy who I grew up watching on PBS and everything. You know, we were read of Sarge stuff, you know, and it's, and then having that with the menacing of 
you know, James Spader, you know, you, Captain America, you know, and then have those two come together was really cool. Okay. So, yeah. And there's some voices where you can't quite play with that, where you take the creativity out of it. How do you kind of keep yourself sane and scratching that creativity well, in the process? to be honest with you, the, the, the getting, getting to the closest fidelity is still scratching that itch because it's, it's, I, I take it, it's a, it's a fun challenge each time, you know, like, um, I, I really get excited. Like, there's there's some voices that are like my white whales, like I'll, like my Bowie Dicks, I'll never get them. Like, uh, Ryan Gosling and DiCaprio, I've been asked to double them so many times, and I cannot get it down. I just can't. I don't know what it is. There's something about their voices that are just elusive to me. But uh, I still want to try it. I'll still, I'll still go on it. So once I get someone down, I'm excited, and I, and I enjoy doing it. Uh, like, I remember when I did Ewan McGregor for the first time, and it was just like, a light bulb went off and I, and I couldn't stop doing it for days and people were like, shut up. I couldn't stop doing it. <laughs> Same thing with Donald Trump. Like Donald Trump came during the pandemic and I, and I just couldn't stop talking to Donald Trump for, for, for days and days. And I was like, okay, we get it. You know, like, so, yeah, but. Well, let's not end this panel on Trump. <laughs> I think it'd be a great way to end this battle. It's the greatest voice I've ever done, okay? Believe me, you're gonna love it. You're gonna love it so much, okay? It's the greatest again. Can we can we end it on Obi Wan telling Donald yes. may the force be with you? Oh yes, of course. No, you, I, I saw Anakin the other day. It was very awkward because the last time I saw him I chopped his legs off and his <laughs> and his hand of course. And I felt very bad about that. And they left him to die in a lava pit, of course, but he kind of deserved it. He was being a bit of a bastard, wasn't he? <laughs> and um, anyway, yes, yeah, so uh, I, I saw him and it was very awkward and now he's Darth Vader, yes, yeah, so um, that's bizarre, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Ross and Ross.